The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome once again to NDE Radio with me, Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening by podcast, on TalkZone, or through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel. Our guest today, Johnny Davis, is an inspirational speaker, best-selling author, entrepreneur, and success coach. Johnny is a graduate of Rutgers University School of Business with a degree in marketing. He entered the network marketing industry in 1996 and learned wealth-building strategies, personal development, and success tips that enabled him to retire from corporate America at age 31. His book, I'm Still Here, From Heart Failure to Heart of a Champion, has been a number one Amazon bestseller. He's also one of the 25 co-authors of the book, Cardiac Athletes. In his previous career, Johnny developed an organization of over 14,000 associates between the US and Canada that generated over $100 million in revenue. Today, as one dedicated to helping others succeed, Johnny combines his personal experience and his business knowledge uh, in coaching with uh, in coaching others to win in every area of their lives. On Christmas Eve 2012, Johnny's heart stopped for over 16 minutes. A longtime sufferer from idiopathic cardiomyopathy, Johnny was in a uh, medically induced coma for two days and given a slim chance of survival by all of the doctors on call that night in the hospital. During that coma, Johnny was blessed with a near-death experience, which he's here to tell us about today. Johnny Davis, welcome to NDE Radio. Well, thank you so much for having me, Lee. It's an honor to be here today. Well, it's an honor to have you. Um, Johnny, in reading your book, I was surprised by your surprise at being a young man with good health habits who nevertheless suffered from a damaged heart. Mm -hmm. And then I realized you didn't discuss your childhood stresses and strains, the kinds of anger and anxiety that uh, growing up a Black kid in Newark, New Jersey could easily involve. So I wonder if you could tell us a little about your growing up years. Well, yeah, you know, I, I purposely left that out of this book because that's going to be in the next book. But uh -huh. <laughs> Well, you can give us a preview then. Yeah, well, you know, as you mentioned, I grew up in the main streets of Newark, New Jersey. I grew up in one of the, the toughest housing projects uh, at that time in Newark, New Jersey that there, there was. And I was surrounded by people that were obviously gangbangers and drug dealers and prostitutes and, and, and pimps. And, and it wasn't all bad. I mean, there were some, some, some really good people with good families in that environment as well. But I was just surrounded by all of the negative things that would actually derail anyone. You know, whether you're Black, white, Hispanic, doesn't matter. If you're in that type of environment, surrounded by those, those, that, that negative energy, so to speak, you can be easily derailed and find yourself dead or in jail or what have you. So that was pretty much my neighborhood, if you will, uh, the mm -hmm. environment that I grew up in. But I was always a studious individual. My mom, she raised us to, to focus on education. She did her very best to keep us in uh, private school. So I went to Catholic school, even though I grew up in that environment. I went to Catholic school, did very well in school, uh, went, on, went to one of the best high schools that was geared toward math and science. And then I was able to graduate from high school and go on to college in Rutgers University. And yeah. during that time, as a, as a child growing up, I can remember um, uh, just going through a lot of stress and, and trauma and just a lot of bitterness and anger because, you know, I had to grow up really fast. My, my father wasn't in the house. He kind of abandoned us when we were young. And so there were some things, being the oldest son, and there's six of us all together, and I'm the oldest son, and I have three older, older siblings, but one of them has deceased now. But being the oldest man or young man, I had to kind of fill his role as well as just being a child. And so I was forced to grow up much faster than I wanted to yeah. and shoulder these adult responsibilities that really added so, a lot of stress to me and on me. And I really did not want to be in that position. I wanted to be a kid. I wanted sure. to enjoy myself. I wanted to grow up and have a great time and just do the things that I wanted to do. And not necessarily have to worry about helping mom pay bills and be, be responsible at 14, 15 years old. 
So I did grow up with a lot of anger and bitterness, bitterness, and I, I held on to that because my father and I never had a great relationship, never had a relationship at all. And unfortunately, he passed away before we could even have a really good discussion to kind of figure out how we could have mended our relationship going forward. No. Uh, I take it your, uh, your mom was uh, a super mom of sorts though, because she seemed to have a lot of wisdom and a lot of uh, faith yes. and uh, herbal cures that you mentioned in the book. And, yes. and uh, at one point when you're um, not feeling well and you're an adult, she rubs your head and it takes you back to when you were eight years old. So I thought, oh, she must have been she must have been a great mother. Um, uh, did she take you to church? Did you go to the Catholic Church or some other church? Well, I went to. We grew up Baptist. Uh huh. As a youngster, I used to go to church with her every Sunday. I did Bible study as well. We went to Catholic school because it was more so not because we were Catholic, but we felt she was more concerned about the quality of education that. Yeah. I was going to receive as well as my two younger brothers. So we went to Catholic school, but we were raised Baptist. And so we were always in church every Sunday. Did you keep that through your teenage years? Or did you, like most teenagers, sort of lose your interest in, in God and religion? Yeah, well, I didn't necessarily lose my interest in God. I, As a teenager, I really just didn't understand. And I started to question what was happening in the world. Things are just becoming so unsettled, settling for me. And I had more questions than I was receiving answers from the pastors and, and from the, the ministers on Sunday school. They were just teaching about the Bible, teaching the word in the Bible, but it, wasn't, it didn't seem like it was applicable in everyday practical life. Yeah. When things surround it, you have all these terrible things going on it just didn't seem like the information they were teaching at, the, at those sermons were kind of adding up and making any sense. It was nothing that I could extract and actually apply in my life to help me get out of the situation that I was in. And so I kind of veered away from that. And when I got to college, I started to really delve in and study religion a little bit more. And I started to look at the different types of religions that, they're out, that, that are out here today. And I started to compare the religion and their their structure. Um, I was looking at their, their their belief systems and things of that nature and the rituals that was associated with each and how they referenced their God and how they referenced God. And, and I kind of formulated a, an opinion about religion itself. And from that point on, I just said, you know what? I am going to focus more on God. And I want to develop a relationship with God. I don't necessarily want to be affiliated with any type of denomination. Mm. I, want to, I want a relationship with God. And so I determined that and I came to that realization early on in my early 20s, not knowing years later that I would actually have a meeting with God. Yes. <laughs> but that's what I, that's what I wanted back then in my early 20s. Yeah. And, uh, and not only was I surprised that you didn't connect the stress to your to your heart condition, you know, the youthful stress, but also uh, that the doctors were so inept and in saying it was a stomach trouble or an ulcer that uh, you know, that uh, was giving you, um, you know, these chest pains it just yeah. seems amazing to me. And then I guess what the doctor who finally diagnosed it asked you if you were a believer and, and you said you were, and he said, God has had his hand on you big time. Yes. So he knew, uh, but I don't understand how they could have been so wrong. I guess because you were so young that they just, it just didn't, you didn't fall into the right category for them to think about it. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. I didn't the category, I didn't meet the criteria. You know, they have their protocol of, if you're experiencing heart failure, you're supposed to be this age, look this way, sound this way, mm. live a certain kind of way. And I didn't fit the mold at all. So they weren't even looking at those things. But I go back to what you just said about my stress and actually it being the, the cause of my, my heart issue. 
I had a conversation with my mom about that. And she said to me, because I had, I had, I wore a smile on my face every day, Lee, but I suffered in silence with anger and bitterness. And I carried that around and it was like a weight on me and I could feel it. I could feel my heart being really, really heavy. And she said to me, you know, the reason why they weren't able to find the diagnosis for you because your my diagnosis is idiopathic cardiomyopathy, right? Fancy word yeah. for the listeners. That means uh, no known cause. We don't know why your heart is failing, right? Right, right. Says, the reason why your heart gave out is because, you know, you, you have so much anger and bitterness. And that's where it resided for you. You know, it, it, it didn't affect your eyesight, your hearing, or anything else. The one thing that needed to change was your heart. And so it was like this old heart had to literally die, had to give out so that a new heart could be born, a new life could be born, a new energy. So you can basically start all over again, a clean slate. And now we're going to build this new heart up. Even though you're still in failure, we're, just, we're going to build it up with love and positivity and and. and you know, just warm, loving energy as opposed to walking around with anger and bitterness. And yeah. so for, on a metaphysical level, I really understood what she was talking about. On a spiritual level, I really understood what she was talking about in terms of having that that death. And it's so symbolic of the heart, because this is where when you think of heart, you think of love. You Not necessarily uh, cardiovascular health, but you think of love. That's where, you, that's where all the love resides, right in the heart. So exactly. my mind, mind literally failed. It died because there was so much anger and bitterness in it. And so I, that's why going forward, and I know we're going to talk about this in, as we go on, that I, I work very diligently. I work very hard to make sure that my heart stays filled with love and, and joy and, and happiness and peace, because I think that was one of the things that ultimately enabled me to to get on the path of, of healing. When your heart wasn't uh, working right, you had a series of panic attacks. Uh, it seemed like when you were being left alone. Yes. Which, if the heart isn't full of love, anger and, and bitterness can uh, bring on panic attacks as well. And you passed out a couple of times? Yes, yes. And went to the doctor, and then it happened again. <laughs> and then there's a very interesting little story you tell in the book. While reading Job, you saw three little demons telling you you're going to die. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, you know, I had separation and anxiety from the hospital. I felt really safe in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I had all the nurses and doctors around me. So when I was discharged and I came home, I freaked out, passed out, went straight back to the emergency room. It happened twice. And the doctor told me, you can't keep doing this. You know, and it's, you're just going to have to tough it out. And it's going to get worse before it gets better, but you you got to tough it out. And uh, I remember we talked about medication and he wanted to put me on. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'm just going to tough it out. And, and so my definition of toughing it out, Lee, was not going to sleep because I was afraid that if I went to sleep, that I wouldn't wake up. And at that yeah. time, I didn't have a defibrillator. I didn't have a pacemaker in my chest to keep me, you know, to save my life if my, my heart rate decreased too low or if it went into an arrhythmia to shock me. I didn't have that. So I could have easily slipped away. And I was afraid, and I, and I knew that. So because I was sleep deprived, I was hallucinating. But you couldn't have told me that I didn't see them just like I can see my hand right in front of my face. And I'm reading the book of Job and I'm just, just looking, reading the scriptures. And I just, out of nowhere, I look up and there were like three different demons, three little demons telling me, pointing at me saying, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And I immediately slammed the book and I put it down. And at that point, I just came to, a, a, I, just, I was so distraught. I was so scared at that point, And I just, I just gave up. You know what it, what I thought of when I when I read that was, you know, Job has false uh, counselors that come to him and say, uh, 
that that uh, God basically that God hates them now uh, because why would he have lost everything if God you know yeah. anyway there there were false counselors uh, as your three demons yes. uh, proved to be and I thought maybe you were maybe you were just you had cast yourself in the role of Job there for a bit. Um, there, you also mentioned you, you said you had trouble sleeping. You had nightmares of bloody fighting every night. Oh yeah. Yeah. What, what, uh, what was that about? Um, I mean, it could have been a, a number of things like the medication that I was taking at the time. I was taking mm. so, so many pills. Yeah. And the side effects of the medication were nightmares, bad dreams, um, all kinds of things. And it was very difficult to get a decent restful sleep. And I, and I felt so tired all the time. Um, and that caused a lot of the hallucinating and things of that nature that I had been experiencing. And I, and I thought that I had kind of gone into a different realm, a different portal, because when you're sleep deprived, you start to see, you know, you, you, you really start to see things. <laughs> that it, your mind does a, a number on you, seriously. And then when you, when you combine that with the bad dreams, it was just like living in a horror movie. And I could not understand why I was going through that. Mm. What did I do to manifest this? Uh, was I that bad of a person in my life? I, didn't, I never killed anybody. I didn't do any heinous acts ever in my life to deserve this kind of spiritual warfare. Uh, coming at me at such an early age, and and I had so much more to do with my life. I was, I had so many questions about why I was experiencing this, and I, but more importantly, Lee, I just wanted it to go away because I, I I thought that I was losing my mind, and I had given up at one point. I just I remember not too long after I had that experience with with the three demons in front of me. And having these nightmares, I just gave up. I said, Lord, please, you know, take me or heal me because I just can't do it anymore. Yeah. And you seem to have periods where you would try to talk yourself back into or give yourself a, a, a counseling, self-counseling, where you would try to just get your spirits up. And you said that at one point you played Rocky and shaved your head and started talking to God and just wanted to uh, make it work. Yes. Even though you were you were up against a, a damaged heart, yes. And then and then there was an interesting thing in the book, uh, which indicates maybe the the absence of love because you asked some friends you, you were involved in the real estate crash, which I guess everyone was at the time, and you asked some friends, including a pastor George, yes. uh, for some advice, and and he says a prayer for you, mm-hmm. and and it soothed you. But after that, you you wrote, I decided I'd never ask friends for help again. And I thought, you kind of missed the, missed the point of the prayer connection there. Yeah, yeah, because I was looking for something else. I didn't understand. Uh, my level of understanding at that time was very, how can I say, elementary. I didn't understand the power of what he had just done mm-hmm. with speaking that prayer over me. I was looking for an actual physical something because I was, when I reached out to him, I was, I was in my space. I was in that moment, that moment where it was dark. I was feeling sorry for myself. And I was just like, why me? And, you know, I'm crying. And you want someone to come and give you a hug and say, it's going to be okay. Hold your hand wipe your face, bring you something, whether it's water or food or something, something that can kind of get your mind off of it. But I was, I was by myself. And that's just one of those things where when you, when you physically need someone's presence and all they can offer you is a prayer, I'm like, what do you, I don't want a prayer. (laughs) Come and see me. Give me a hug. I'm hurting over here. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's how I was feeling. And so that's why I said, ah, I won't do this anymore because if I reach out for help, I'm I'm in my, my most vulnerable moment and you can't help me. You can't get to me. You can't get me what I need. 
but I didn't realize that you gave me what I needed. You gave me a prayer. Yeah. Because it's working in the spiritual realm before it works, it manifests itself in the physical. But I didn't understand, I didn't really understand it like that at that time because I was just in so much pain that I just wanted someone to just take it away, physically take it away. And and it also seemed like you were determined to be self-sufficient in a lot of ways too. Um, you t- you t- took up vitamins and supplements, which are, are good, but probably not good enough to cure your heart. Yeah. And you, you say in the book, I was still Johnny Davis, the man who kept it all together, which sounded like maybe those teenage years when you were the man of the family. Yes. Yes. I, I just reverted back to keeping everything or I like to, I, I, at that time, I like to think that I had everything under control. Mm. Um, I'm not saying I was a control freak, but I, I, I was the person that always had everything together. And I had to, because from such a very young age, the only person that I could depend on was myself and my mother. And so I had to kind of make sure that everything was just so. And I became extremely self-reliant and self-sufficient. And I didn't really ask for too much help. I would go and find the answers that I needed myself. And then I would go and whatever I needed to do, I would make it happen. So that that instinct that was inbred in me since I was a youngster, that survival mode. It was just like when you grow up in, a, in that type of environment, you know, you're, you're in survival mode. And so yeah. I never got out of that mode of, okay, well, this is the problem. It needs to be fixed. This is how you're going to fix it. This is how you survive. This is how you've been surviving your whole life. Instead of thriving and exceeding and excelling, you know, you go into that survival instinct and that's, that's what always kicked in. But when you're in survival mode all the time, that creates so much stress. So even being self-sufficient like that and relying on yourself and not allowing people to help you or asking for help, you put so much added pressure and so much added stress on yourself. And I didn't realize that being that way was a detriment to my health. About that time, I guess, you uh, discovered a, a book or books by Miles Monroe. Yes. And I summarize some of the quotes that you have in your book that you attribute to him. Understanding your purpose in life. Without purpose, life is an experiment or haphazard journey that results in frustration, disappointment, and failure. In the absence of purpose, time has no meaning, energy has no reason, and life has no precision. No amount of accomplishments can replace the power of working toward your dreams. Meditate to hear God's voice. And then you said, after that, I asked God to show me the way. Yes. How much impact did he have on your life? Dr. Monroe? Yeah. Oh, God rest his soul. Dr. Monroe was a huge, huge source of refuge for for me because he had all the answers. A gentleman that was so wise. And it just seemed like all of the questions that I've always had about why I was going through this and what this meant and what I was meant to do. And he painted such a vivid picture of what purpose is and how to focus on that. And once I really, really understood that and got focused on following and first discovering my purpose and then walking in that, that I would never be stressed out. I would have, I would go from a wandering generality to a meaningful specific. Like I knew exactly every single day what I was going to do and what my mission was in life. And I can approach that every single day with an energy and a love and and a clarity that I never had before. So he was huge. He was huge for me because I had never understood purpose the way that Dr. Miles Monroe broke it down. But that's exactly what I needed in order for me to have that picture for my own self. So I can evolve and reach my full beauty, meaning reaching my fullest potential. Yeah. I don't know if it was about that time, but at some point you had a, what I thought was a real breakthrough dream of your, about your father. And you said you smelled his cigarette smoke. Yes. <laughs> but then he called you son. So it must've been a dream. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us about that. 
Yeah, so I remember vividly, I was lying in bed and my dad had come to me in a dream and I, man, it still it still gives me chill bumps when I even think about it right now. Mm-hmm. But I smell his cigarettes because he was, a, he was a smoker. And I looked up, but of course I'm sleeping, but I look up and I see him and then he just kind of floats out of my bedroom and he goes into the living room, he sits down on the couch and I'm like, Dad, how did you how did you get here? How did you get here? And he wouldn't, you know, he said, Oh, don't worry about that, son. And I'm like, okay, this this has to be a dream, because my dad never called me son. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we go out into the backyard and I look at the lock and I notice that the lock is broken. And I said, Dad, why did you why did you break the lock? All you had to do was just ring the doorbell. I would have let you in. Oh, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. So we go outside and he sees the bushes. And he's like, you have to water your bushes, son. You got to water your bushes. And I said, I'll I'll get to it. I'll water the bushes. (laughs) And we go back in the house and I'm following him. And then he goes into darkness and I stop. And something in me, even during that dream, said, don't go there. That's, that's not for you. And he kind of vanished into oblivion. And I remember telling my mom about that. And uh, she said, yeah, he came to visit me too. And my brother as well. But it was just so surreal to, to experience that. And then that, would, that led to other dreams, other, other things that actually transpired later on. Yeah, you have some after after the NDE. You said, I guess, in, as you were recovering from that. We didn't yes. talk about that in a little while. But th- now, here's something about America that it really is irritating. You needed a pacemaker, a defibrillator pacemaker. Yes, the insurance wouldn't pay for it because you didn't have symptoms <laughs> until you died. Until you actually died, they wouldn't come through for you. Right. So there you are taking all of these pills, which weren't. I'm helping a little bit and, and watching your diet and doing exercise, which of course does help, but only to a certain extent. And then you have a heart attack and there's your wife, Rachel's there left to do CPR while the firemen are coming. And they said it was only a 5% chance that you would have survived this sudden cardiac arrest that could have been fixed if the insurance company had done what it should have before. Right. Right. Your wife sounds like a wonderful woman, by the way. <laughs> Everything from doing CPR to cooking, she seems to be absolutely wonderful. And she writes a chapter or two chapters, is it, in your book yes. from her point of view while you're in a coma, yes. describes what you what she went through, which was, of course was profound and horrible, I'm sure. Um, they chilled your body because I guess they got your heart beating again. I know most hospitals now do this, but you told me that you were lucky to be in Charlotte, North Carolina, because that was one of the two hospitals in the country that knew about cooling the body to uh, extend uh, your survival. Yes. It was a very new technique at that time. Yeah. And then along with that, when your mom arrived, According to Rachel's description, she prayed and she prayed and she prayed and she prayed over you with her arms raised. And uh, God listens to prayers often, not always, but he did in in your case. And then you opened your eyes. Yes. Yes. Um, That moment. And of course, you know, I don't recall anything about any of that. I just know that when I came to, this is what my wife told me and my mom told me what she had done as well. Yeah. She had her hand, one hand on me, the other hand outstretched to God, and she was praying for me. So, yeah, my wife is, she's incredible. She's a, I, I can't, I call her my wife saver, Lee. Not my life saver, she's my wife <laughs> I would not be here without her. That is the <laughs> honest to God's truth. Well, at this point, why don't you go ahead and describe your near-death experience? Yeah, so it was during the time, I believe, I guess when I was in, my, in the coma, I could feel my, my presence, my energy, my essence, my spirit 
departing from my body. And I was in a space where I felt like it was just the, the most beautiful place, the most beautiful feeling of love that I, that I could ever imagine. It's like, uh, I would imagine it would be like a newborn, how a newborn would feel in the arms of his mother for the first time. You know, it was just like the safety and the sanctity and the peace and the love. And that's how I felt. My, my, my spirit was just at, with, at one with, with everything in, in that space, in the universe. And I did not want to leave. Now, the interesting thing is that I was conscious of the fact, my spirit was conscious of the fact that I was not in my body. And wherever I was at that time, that I wanted to stay where I was. And just as I was getting comfortable, getting used to my space and just being there and just like really acknowledging the, 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 the beauty and the love of where I was, I heard a voice that I couldn't tell if it was the, but I couldn't tell if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice, but it was a voice and it was, it was perfect silence too, where I was. And it was a loud but subtle voice that said to me, it is, it's not your time. You have to go back. Mm. And I remember f- feeling, I don't want to leave. I want to stay here. And the voice said, you know, it's not your time. You have to go back. And I just remember feeling like I didn't want to come back. And my wife was telling me that while I was away out of my body, she was praying for me. Everyone was praying for me. She was whispering in my ear. She was telling me that she loved me. Come back. We need you. We love you. You're my hero. You're my champion. She's saying all of these things. And I told her, I said, babe, I didn't hear a word you said. I didn't hear anything you said. And I, could, and I just told her, I said, you know, I love you with everything that I have in me. But I did not want to come back. And it was, it's a, it was a feeling of not, it was a feeling of being disconnected from this reality. Not even knowing that you had a connection here. That's, that was my experience, that I was totally oblivious to anything that was on this side of the plane. So it was like, I didn't miss it. Like it did, it, I didn't feel that it, it ever existed, if that makes sense. So the only thing that I remember feeling in that moment is that where I was, I didn't want to leave. And I think about that feeling every day. I've been thinking about that feeling every day since then, Lee. And um, it makes me sad sometimes because I don't want to have to die just yet to feel that sense of love and peace. But I know that that love and peace is there. And so that's the thing that really gives me solace and it's taken my, my fear of death away because I know that it really isn't the end. It's a beginning. You're literally just transitioning from one form of, of life to another. You don't remember seeing anything while you were there? No, I didn't see anything. I didn't see a light or anything like that. Um, I didn't see anyone else, but I knew that where I was, that I was in this space of maybe transition, of actually staying there. I don't know exactly why I came back. I don't know how that happened, but it did. Hmm. Well, when people hear it's not your time, that's when they usually have to have to come back. Yeah. But it left you with the knowledge that God is real. Yes. And that there's nothing to fear about death. No. Yeah. Those are the two powerful things that most people bring back, no matter how elaborate or simple the near-death experience is. Those two factors are are pretty key and worth bringing back as a message. God intends that, I'm sure, that we talk about these things. Yes. Now, you said when you got home after this that you had – weird dreams that you still felt connected to the other side and you had beings visited. Tell us about all that. Yeah. So it was, it was really, um, as I explained to my wife, I said, babe, I think 
uh, wherever I was, there must have been a portal or something that were that was opened. And when I came back, that portal must have been still open or some some being, some entity, some energy or something must have come back with me as well. Because I was getting visitors from people that, like a, my good friends from high school, I, I got a, a visit from his dad and I had never met his father. In fact, his father had passed away when we were in high school. Hmm. I never met him, but he visited me and he wanted me to give him a message, you know, by telling me that he was proud of him. He said that four times, he repeated that four times. And I can remember calling my friend and I told him, I said, hey, you know, I want to tell you something, but I don't know if this is really going to freak you out. And I don't want to freak you out. And he said, what? And I said, you know, I never met your dad. He said, yeah, I know you never met your, you know, my dad. And I said, well, he came to visit me in my dream. And he said, what? And I said, he came to visit me in my dream and he told me that he was proud of you. And so he... He hangs up the phone, you know, he's like upset. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I know I freaked him out. And I called him back a couple of days later. I said, are you okay? I mean, I'm sorry. I didn't want to, I didn't want to tell you because I didn't know how you were going to respond to it. And he says to me, no, you answered my question. I've been asking myself this question if my father had had been proud of the man I had become. And you answered that question by giving me that message. Just things like that was happening. Um, it was just, it was really weird because I felt like I still had a connection between, you know, this world and that world. Um, my my heightened sense of empathy it just increased tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Like I can really feel the pain in the world. I can feel the sadness you know, just this, the energy, because Lee, we're all energy. Our spirits, just energy. And I was just feeling the the weight, it felt like the weight of the world, all of this negative energy, the sadness and, and just hurt and pain. I can feel it. And it made me feel that way. And I'm like, wait a minute, I got to disconnect from this because I don't want to walk around feeling depressed and feeling like my world is crashing on me. I just, I just, I just came back here, and I, I, I have a message to get to the world, and I just didn't know how to process it all. And so, even to this day, I can still feel my my heightened sense of 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 empathy to to connect and and, and sense that energy in anyone that I come across. You know how like when you meet someone and. Right off the bat, sometimes you're you're able to tell, oh, no, it's, it's not something. It's, it's just something just not quite right with this person. I don't really like him, or it may maybe that person didn't even say a word to you, but they just didn't feel right. And so for me, that's been heightened. Just like when a dog, you meet a dog for the first time, and the dog comes to you, and the owner says, "Oh, he never goes to anybody. Oh my God, he must love me." <laughs> Or if he, or, and then he meets someone else and he's like, oh, rah, 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 rah. he's going crazy. Yeah. It's that kind of, it's that kind of sense, that sensory perception. And so for me, that's been heightened. Wow. Were there any other dreams or visions or beings who visited besides that one? I mean, it was just the, the dreams, you know, it was like, um, I would tell my wife, sometimes I felt like I was under attack. Like, I had, there were beings that were trying to harm me. Mm. And it was, I guess, maybe because they knew that I had this big purpose and I had this big mission to fulfill and that whatever I was going to do was going to be really big. It was going to be impactful. It was going to change the world. And they were trying to stop that from happening. And so I would have these dreams of these beings pressing their arm on my chest, trying to smother me, you know, I will wake up wow. and I would see I'm sleeping, but I'm awake and I can see an image. It's like a dark image at the foot of my bed and I can, I can feel them. My wife would tell me I'm getting chill bumps now. <laughs> she would uh, tell me 
I was screaming in the middle of the night. Who's there? Why are you here? Wow. Why are you here? Get out of here. Get away. And they were just, you know, they were vanished. Like, I wish my wife was here because she can tell you even more of the things that happen while I'm sleeping. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I told her, I said, I think, you know, something happened when I, when I, when I went through there. There were was, there was some other things that kind of slipped in as well. Or somehow, some way, I don't know exactly how all that works, obviously. But yeah, I know that the spirit world is definitely, it's real. It's 100% real. And no one can tell me otherwise. Uh, you can get me on a Zoom with the smartest person that, that has 10 PhDs, and I can tell you unequivocally, this is real. And... Uh, you can't you can't convince me otherwise because I I experience it and I feel it and I'm just doing my very best to let everyone know that these things are real you know the energy is real and then my what the message is with all of this as well we as human beings lead we know we're so lost we're we're so lost as humans we don't realize that we are truly 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 spiritual beings having a human experience and that we're going to transition out of this, this suit we call a body. We're going to transition out of this and we're going to go back into the essence from which we come. Mm. And our only responsibility here while we're on this side of the plane, having this human experience is to create the best experience that we can for our fellow man to help mankind, to make the world a better place for every single person. And I truly believe that with all my heart, regardless of what your race, color, creed is, it doesn't matter. We're all here having our own human experience. And my, my role as a fellow human in, is to help you, Lee, in such a way that I can, in any way that I can, to help you make your human experience just as wonderful, impactful, as powerful as we can. And so this interaction right now, this is not by accident. This interaction by, right now uh, is going to transform someone's life. A listener is going to hear this and they're going to hear something that's going to resonate with them. It's going to change the way they're thinking. It's going to put them on a completely different trajectory and open up a whole new pathway of infinite possibilities that they never knew existed. But that's the power that we share as that's energy. Yeah. I suspect, and I agree with you, there are dark forces, although it may only be on this plane. But you had built a career, a very successful career out of, I mean, talk about pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. It takes tremendous ego and, and focus and determination and a certain amount of selfishness to make that kind of um, success out of out of your business they were probably waiting just waiting for you <laughs> and suddenly they realized that you were developing a whole different line of empathy of compassion of a of, of the idea of service mm-hmm. that that was going to take that they they were not going to have any grasp on you at all yeah and so that's you know very few people i think that i've talked to have had um, either a vision of demons before their NDE or visits from what you could call perhaps demons and dreams afterwards. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, you, you just beat them down because, you know, there's a God, you had this NDE and it, it opened your eyes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I have a, I have a, well, you know, when we talked before, I don't have faith in God because mm-hmm. now I know God. It's been revealed. And so my, my, my walk and my posture is a little different. My conviction is a little different than the average person because I know for a fact. And so I don't fear anything that comes my way. And you got to remember, Lee, I grew up in one of the worst neighborhoods ever, right? Mm-hmm. So it's embedded in me to fight. I've always been a fighter. And, and so now I, I understand that there's negative energy and there's positive energy. There's good forces and there's dark forces. 
Uh, and that's just the, that's how everything keeps stays in balance. You know, we have a negative and positive for, for everything. And I'm on the positive side. And as long as I can continue to breathe and as long as I can continue to, to get the message out and love, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I am I am light. So I'm going to be the light. I'm not darkness. I'm not ignorance. I'm not bitterness and anger. That's not me. I'm not a negative person. So I'm going to walk in my role as light and continue to fight and continue to just spread as much energy, positive energy and information, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding as I possibly can. So, but sometimes, yeah, we have to come across those forces and those people that don't mean us any good. And we have to stand on our truth, whether it's in the physical or the spiritual world, and, and, and wear your armor of God and walk forward. And that's what I do. Yeah. You had a sentence in your book that I copied down. And I wanted to ask you about it. I consider myself an answer to my tribe's prayers. Yes. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, you know, I believe that we're all assigned. There, there are people that are assigned to us that we probably haven't met yet. And like this show, for instance, you have listeners that follow you, that listen to you, that look up to you, that want to hear what you have to say, or a guest that you have on your show. You provide the platform for these, these people to come on your platform and share their experience and their knowledge. Someone is listening for that. And for me, I believe that I'm the answer for people that are looking for answers. They have questions. They want to know, well, how did you get over your hurdle with your heart issue? How did you defeat this? How did you overcome that? Can you give me the blueprint for transforming my thinking? Because I was once in a, in a rut, in a hole, just like you. I was feeling abandoned. I was feeling by myself. I was feeling unloved. I was feeling like I was defeated, just like you were. Can you show me how to get through that? And there's an army of people that are feeling the same exact way. And they're going to resonate with my message. They may not necessarily resonate with the next person who maybe have gone through a similar experience. That person may not necessarily be, necessarily be speaking on the frequency that this group of people over here can understand or they can hear. So I believe that we all have that. We all have our, our tribes of people that are looking for answers. And those of us that have been elevated to positions of leadership, that have gone through certain experiences, that have learned how to take their, their mess and turn it into a message or their pain and turn it into a passion. Those of us that have been able to do that, those people are waiting for us to step up and say, I'm here. I'm not the end all be all, but at least I can give you some things that you can apply the practical knowledge, the practical information that you can apply here on this plane right now to transform or accomplish, manifest, whatever it is, whatever it is that you want to do. And that's what I meant when I said, you know, I'm the answers to my tribe's prayers. I, I truly believe that I have been spared. My life has been spared for such a time as now. Because there were so many times where I could have been taken away from here. And so... I don't spend time thinking about what if. I don't spend time thinking about why God spared my life and these people over here didn't live. I don't worry about those things because it's above my pay grade. And I'm too grateful. I'm walking in gratitude right now. and I'm walking in gratitude every day. So I don't have the time to think about why this and why that. What I'm focusing on now is just helping me this world a better place to live by connecting with the next person. Toward the end of the book, you write a lot actually about vision and purpose. And you have written, everyone has a purpose for being alive. And then a little later, you say your vision is internal, not external. God hid everything that a thing is supposed to become within itself. Mm -hmm. So um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so it's like, I want, I want you to imagine if you had 
a bunch of seeds in your hand. If I gave you some apple seeds and I said, Lee, what are these? And you're going to say, well, Johnny, obviously these are apple seeds. And I would say, you're only half correct. And you'll say, why? And I'll say, no, you take those seeds. If you plant those seeds in the right environment and you give the seeds what it needs in terms of rain, sunshine, you don't have apple seeds in your hand, Lee. You have a forest, but you can't see the forest. The forest lies in the infinite potential of that seed. In that seed lies the genetic code to produce more apples, to produce trees, that produce more apples, that produce trees. But you can't see that with these seeds in your hand. So the forest lies in the infinite potential. So we have, you know, if if an apple seed can produce a forest, what can we as human beings with the infinite capacity to create anything and everything that we want to do, what can we manifest? So everything that we need is buried with inside of us We just have to be planted in the right environment, giving the right nurturing so that we can manifest that and we can reach our full beauty as human beings. Someone named Johnny had to use apple seeds as an example. (laughs) (laughs) You wrote, we need more love. The world is spiraling into a really bad place. And this was written before Putin and Russia invading the Ukraine and, yeah. and but oh it's it's an ongoing spiral. We also I think the last time we had a conversation you said we're living in a simulation. Yeah. So if the world is spiraling into a really bad place what is our obligation to this simulation that we're living in? You know it's spiraling in its, into the bad place because there's a lack of of love. There's a lack of, you know, there's, there's so much fear. There's so much bitterness. There's so much hatred. There's so much ignorance. When I say in, ignorance, I'm talking about the lack of knowledge of who you are. We don't know who we are as people. We don't know what our, what our purpose is. And you have people in high places that are just filled with so much, you know, let's say negative energy. Some people might call it evil. Some people may call it hate, what have you. We, if we're going to change that, we have to first come into knowledge and understanding of who we are as people, as human beings. Understand our purpose. Understand that, you know, how to use our energy properly and how to channel it to help people and not harm people, to help people and not murder people, to help people and not kill people over, over resources, over, over tools, over things that we as human beings, we create. We create these things. We give these things meaning. We give it value. Is a collective agreement that we agree that, you know, the $5 bill in your pocket, it actually is worth $5. We agree on that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. So we create these things and we assign value to it. And then we, we become a slave to our own creation. We become a slave to the things that we produce. And if you start thinking on a higher level, you're like, wait a minute. This is not, this makes no sense. This is not even real money. This has no value. We, we did this. So <laughs> we have to just take a step back and take a step out and say, wait a minute. We have to get back to the essence of what life truly is. And what the meaning of that is and put love back into everything that we do. When you remove love, you remove God from everything because God is love. If you remove God, you remove love from everything Then you invite chaos, you invite chaos into your world. And that's what we're seeing today. Yeah. You're seeing that and it's going to continue to happen unless we collectively band together and say, okay, we have to take a stance and say, no more. Right at the end of the book, you have uh, your mantra, you say, which you (laughs) scattered throughout your house. If it doesn't evolve me, it will not involve me. 
That's correct. And also time is of the essence. So we are, uh, we have to focus on this, don't we? And you also talk about meditation as it being a really important um, thing to do. Yes. So take, take a minute to talk about that before we conclude. Yes. Meditation is one of the things that we all need to engage in on a daily basis and just disconnect from the, all of the, the clutter and the chatter and the noise that we're bombarded with every day. You know, we're, we've become slaves to our phones. We're on social media every day, all day. And you know, our minds become so boggled down with so much junk. Just junk from the TV, junk from your phone, your, whatever device you use. We have to disconnect from that so that we can silence the noise and we can actually hear God's voice and receive the divine downloads and get your brain on the right frequency so you can tune in to the things that you really want to manifest and hear so that you can produce that. Right. You have to be able to do that through meditation. You got to do that. It's, it's vital to your existence. It's vital to your, your personal healing, your spiritual healing, physical healing, emotional healing. It's vital that you do that. And if what you are engaging in, if it does not evolve you to make you a better human being, then why engage in it? And I think if you approach that with that mindset, you can kind of live a really, really straight and narrow life. If you get into the habit of asking yourself this question, how does this make me better? How does this help improve me as a human? And if it doesn't, if this conversation doesn't, if this activity doesn't do it, then why engage in it? Yeah. If it doesn't evolve me, it will not involve me. That's correct. John, tell the folks how they can find your book and more about the success counseling you provide. So you can actually find my book directly on Amazon. You can go to Amazon.com and you can just type in, I'm still here from heart failure to heart of a champion. You can do it that way, or you can go directly to my website at www.succeedwithjd.com. You can actually get the book there. And also, if you want to connect with me, just send me an email right on the website, and I'll be more than happy to have one have my assistant get back to you, and we can set something up. Johnny Davis, thank you so much for this show. It's going to prove very valuable, I think, to uh, lots of listeners. And I hope lots of listeners do listen. A lot of good information here. And uh, I hope they uh, pick up your book. It will give them, especially if anyone has heart problems out there, because it gives you a real insight into what you can go through. If they picked up on your example, they might save themselves a lot of wear and tear before they got to the right answers. So, So thanks again. If listeners would like to hear this show or any of our more than 400 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio, with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to like, follow, and share our NDE radio Facebook page. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at TalkZone, for more NDE radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.